Picking up where we left off last week, it should be chapter 10. Um, chapter 9 finishes with Uruel's surprise at seeing Psyche across the little stream down in what Bardia has called the Valley of the God. Um, and notice even when chapter 10 opens, Bardia is afraid that it's her ghost. Careful, lady, it may be her wraith. It may, I, I, to the bride of the god. It is a goddess. Okay. Describe Bardia. Um, religious. Um, or, uh, what does that mean? Say superstitious. Okay, superstitious. Uh, what's his occupation? He's a soldier. He's a soldier. He's not a philosopher. He's not a thinker. Okay, he's a doer. He has very simple concepts of religion. And, um, okay. But what does that mean? He has very simple concepts of religion. Does he believe in Ungit? Yes. Yes. Wholeheartedly. Does he believe that one can anger the gods? Yes. Yes. Does he believe that one can placate the gods? Yes. Does he believe that our actions can influence the gods? Yes. Okay. So he doesn't think the gods are separate from humanity. Not in the sense of um, they don't care about what goes on with humanity. He sees that the, how do I put this? The lives of the gods, let's say, and the lives of humans are delicately intertwined. Okay. But he is always doing his best to not get, notice, too close. He, he wants the gods to kind of stay over there while he does his own um, bit, while he believes wholeheartedly in the gods. He doesn't necessarily want to see them. He, he wants his belief to kind of remain a belief rather than solid proof of the existence of the gods, okay? A rule, however, wants what? She wants proof. She wants facts. She wants knowledge. She wants it to be logically rational, okay? She doesn't want belief. Because, at least within the context of the novel, um... What is there included in belief? There's always an element of what? Obedience. Okay, obedience possibly. How about doubt? Mm -hmm. There's an element of doubt. Because what is one saying when one says, I believe in something? Like, I believe in the brute of the mountain. You wouldn't have to say that if the brute you wouldn't have to say that if you saw the brute of the mountain every day. Okay? It's, it's not a fact in that sense. Go back to what Lewis wrote about the triple distinction between myth, fact, and truth. Okay? On, uh, in Paralandra. So, there's always that element of not knowing when one says, I believe in. Okay? A rural sees her sister. She doesn't think she's a ghost. She doesn't think she's a wraith. She wants to get across and hold her. So they finally find a place for her to ford the river. And they talk a little bit. And notice what Psyche does. She offers refreshment. Okay. Um, page 104. Psyche gives her little cool dark berries in a green leaf and says, is it not food for the gods? And the rule says, nothing sweeter. Psyche says, hold on, hold on, before they start talking. After the banquet, now you have to drink. 
And she holds her hands under the little trickle of water, cups them, brings them up to Arul's lips, and Arul drinks. And Arul says, you know, this is the best cup in the world. It's the cup I love best in the world. Then it's yours, sister. Okay. Now, Arul's looking at Psyche as Psyche is doing this, and she's thinking, she's acting kind of childish. Okay. And she immediately starts firing questions. How did you escape? What are you to do? What are we to do now, etc.? Notice Psyche's response. Do? Why be merry? What else? Why should our hearts not dance? Now, turn back for a moment. I don't know if it's the same pagination in yours. Page 96. Arul and Bardia are making their way to the mountain. And she's starting to feel good. She's feeling better the farther she gets away from Gloam. And it's as if there's a voice, but there is no voice, that says, Why should your heart not dance? And she goes through this big long thing of, Why? I know why I shouldn't dance, because I'm ugly, and blah, 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 blah. Okay? Why should our hearts not dance? Psyche asks her. And then a rule starts on again about forgiving Redival and such. And Psyche says, shh. Because what she hears when a rule talks is, wah, 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 wah. it's just blah, blah, blah. And notice what Psyche tells her. I'll not rest till you're as happy as I. Now, that's prophetic. <laughs> that's also foreshadowing. Because what is Psyche shortly going to begin doing? These three heroic feats. Okay? You know, gathering the wool, separating the seeds, those things. She won't rest from those until Psyche, excuse me, until a rule becomes what? The bride of a god. You too are Psyche, which means you too will be devoured. You too will be the wedding, okay? But Psyche goes on here. I'll not rest till you're as happy as I, page 105. But you haven't yet even asked me my story. Weren't you surprised to find this fair dwelling place? And me living here like this? Have you no wonder? That is, is there no part of your psyche, of your, you know, mental abilities that allows for awe? Is everything clear-cut and rational and logical? It's almost like she's asking a rule. You know, when you see that beautiful multicolored stripe that forms an arc in the sky, do you look at that and just say, well, isn't it amazing how the sunlight is refracted in the water or ice droplets in the air and it creates that beautiful prism of color? Even that's a little too um, maybe adorned. Though. Yeah, I mean, even that's a little... Okay, so they start to talk. And Psyche says, talks about not being in her right mind when she left the palace. And top of 106, this is the long paragraph that begins, I wasn't in my right mind when I left the palace, or when we left the palace. And she says, I saw you at the top of the stairway, but I couldn't even lift my hand to wave to you. Why? Anybody remember what happened at the actual sacrifice? She was drugged. Yeah, she was drugged. Okay. And I thought it didn't matter because you two would wake up presently and find it was all a dream. And it, in a sense, it was, wasn't it? And you are nearly awake now. Okay. What is Psyche saying? And, and what does what... Psyche is saying, what does that show about the difference right now 
between Psyche and Oruol. Okay, Psyche said, you would wake up presently and find it was all a dream. And in a sense it was, wasn't it? And you are nearly awake now. Is Psyche all the way awake? What's been going on with Psyche the last month? Or however long it's been? Um, well, depending on your perspective, she's either been living in the woods off of berries and... Uh, okay, is it depending <laughs> upon your perspective? At this point, kind of. Because that's what Lewis partly wants us to examine here. Okay, because that perspective, that depending upon your perspective, whose perspective is that in the novel? That's a rules perspective. Because what does she think has been going on with Psyche for the last, I think at one point Psyche mentions, you know, how long it's been. It's been like six weeks. Okay. How, how is she dressed? Her clothes are in rags. Okay. Um, does she look like, look like she's starving? No. Is she a raving lunatic? No. Is she smeared with dirt? No. Okay. So, she keeps talking. And she talks about being led to the tree. And being chained there. And page 109, she says, um, you know what I was thinking all this time? What? At first I was trying to cheer myself with all that old dream of my gold and amber palace on the mountain and the god trying to believe it. In other words, she was hearkening back to her childhood fairy tales that she had created and saying, it's okay. It's all going to be okay. The nice god of the gray mountain is going to come and rescue me and build me an amber palace. And we're going to live in it forever. And if I click my heels three times, you know. But I couldn't believe in it at all. I couldn't understand how I ever had. Why? Well, she's on the gray mountain. It's not what she thought it was. Okay. She says, all that, all my old longings were clean gone. Why? Because they were images. They were shadows of a real longing. And that real longing is about to be fulfilled. Okay. Why, why have the images when you're getting ready to come into the presence of the real thing? So she says, the only thing that did me good was quite different. She starts to talk about thinking about the fox's philosophy and such. And she says, well, the weather, the weather changed. I was suddenly cool. And then it started to rain. And then I saw him. Whom? The west wind. Saw it. Notice, a rule corrects her, because the wind is an it, it's not a him. It's also an invisible it, so okay. the, the, the whole thing breaks down if you try and, <laughs> if you try and deep respond by it. Okay. Psyche, not it, him, the god of the wind, West Wind himself. Okay, so a rule's trying to position herself as the older, wiser sister, Psyche's not taking any of it. She's saying, uh-uh, you don't understand. I saw the real wind, and it is a hymn. Were you awake, Psyche? No, it was no dream. Notice Psyche immediately sees what a rule is trying to get at. One can't dream things like that, because one's never seen things like that. Notice what she's Asserting, you can only dream about what you've actually seen. Or, you can dream up new things based upon things that you've seen. 
You can't have this kind of dream. Why? Because one has never seen it. He was in human shape, but you couldn't mistake him for a man. And then she says, oh, sister, you'd understand if you'd seen. Because the way I read this is between, you couldn't mistake him for a man, and, oh, sister, you'd understand if you'd seen, a rule kind of gives her a look like, what? Okay, you said he was in human shape, but he wasn't a man. How can I make you understand? Let me see. Uh, lepers. You've seen lepers. Yes. You know how healthy people look beside them? You mean healthier, readier than ever? Yes. Now, we, beside the gods, are like lepers beside us. Notice what she has done there. Notice how she has argued from the seen to the unseen by images of the seen. Lewis, in a little essay called, if I'm not completely mixing this up, I think it's in Transposition, an essay called Transposition. He argues how, or he discusses, how we argue about things that we cannot logically prove or see with our own eyes. And he says we use images that we know aren't aware of. So, for example, Christians talk about God as Father. Why? Because they've seen fathers, real fathers. Okay? And the image is always based upon all the best images, the ideal images of fatherhood and such. Notice how a rule takes this analogy. So you mean that God was red? She's like, no. I see it's no use. I see I've not given you the idea at all. Never mind. You shall see God's for yourself, a rule. It must be so. I'll make it so. Again, okay, a little irony there because she doesn't realize the truth of her words. But, but Psyche, they hadn't stripped you naked, had they? Because Psyche said, I felt ashamed. No, I wasn't ashamed of that. I was ashamed of being immortal. Well, how could you help that? Now, everybody in here has an experience of being ashamed of some part of your mortality. I don't mean the mortality part of you that's going to die. I mean your physical nature. Like you've not been able to run fast enough, jump high enough, you've not been able to sing well enough, etc. Okay? And yet, is that anything one should be ashamed of. If you're born without the ability to carry a tune, you might be able to take voice lessons. Okay? And it might improve, but you're probably not going to be a Luciano Pavarotti. Similarly, similarly, if you're not born able to jump, you're probably not going to be a Michael Jordan. Or if you're not born able to run fast, you're not going to be a Usain Bolt. Or if you're not born with the facility for mathematics, you're not going to be an Einstein or a Newton. Okay? It's just not going to happen, which is probably why most of you are in this kind of class and not in a mathematics class. Okay? <laughs> How could you help that? Don't you think the things people are most ashamed of are the things they can't help? Notice, I thought of my ugliness. She can't help that. Okay? Throughout this entire book, too, they, Lewis never actually describes, like, her... Like, we never get a never physical description. Her All we get is, you know, her father takes her up to a mirror and says, you would give that to the gods. No, it's just, he calls her a goblin at times. Which, you know, why I think this image probably isn't ugly enough because that individual isn't necessarily ugly. She's just kind of plain. Not by modern standards. But like, I kept I kept wondering like would my 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 question was like would we now see this person as ugly? Like 
it's, it's maybe there's some sort of arbitrary quality that she lacks that that just. <laughs> I I think based upon how her father reacts, how others react her, she's supposed to be hideous. I don't know if that means she's got three noses and one eye up here and her lip drool hangs and her teeth are sticking out, you know, whatever it is. She's very unattractive. Let's just put it that way, okay? So, she, he took me in his beautiful arms, which seemed to burn me, though the burning didn't hurt. Pulled me right out of the iron girdle. Notice he doesn't have to unlock it. It just... And she's like, are you sure this happened? You must have been dreaming. Okay, so if it was a dream, how did I get here? If it was a dream, then why am I not still locked up at the tree? It's more likely everything that had happened to me before this was a dream. So one of the questions I think that could be asked, because of what Psyche has now said twice, about all of her life before this being a dream. Is Psyche alive in the sense that we're alive? Or is Psyche, at this point, more alive? In the sense of Christ saying, I have come that you might have life in abundance. It's not talking about here. Actually, I, I actually think she's... I actually thought about this, and given the framework of the original myth, where she becomes a goddess after this happens, like she isn't a goddess prior to this, I think, what Lu, I think, I think Lewis would draw the parallel there when she is finally taken up and made a goddess like, um, like Cupid. That would be when she passes on to the greater life. Um, I think in this case, she's still terrestrial. <laughs> okay, it's possible. It's also possible she's died. Mm -hmm. And that this is her quote-unquote glorified body. Glorified why? Because she lives with the God. And the God can't have anything less than perfect. Which would then also make it a little bit more understandable how she can do the three tasks that she can do. Mm -hmm. That enables a rule to also experience that. Okay? So, she goes on and talks about Glom, the king, Bata, etc. And she says, um, and I was taken to the God's house. And she says, and you know, it wasn't like the golden amber house I used to imagine. If it had been, then I would have thought, oh, I'm just dreaming. But I saw it wasn't. And not quite like any house in this land, nor quite like the Greek houses the fox described. Why need I try to show it in words? You could see it was a god's house at once. I don't mean a temple where a god is worshipped. A god's house where he lives. She says, I wouldn't go into it, but I had to. A voice said, enter your house, Psyche, the bride of the God. She says, and I was ashamed again because of my mortality, terribly afraid. But I heard all these voices telling me welcome. Well, what kind of voices? Psyche, I mean, a rule's trying to get it. Is she really completely off her rocker? And she says, like women's voices. They keep talking. She talks about how the spirit voices gave her food, gave her clothing, etc. And she says, um, and I was terribly shy when it came to taking off my clothes, but you said they were all she spirits. You still don't understand. This has nothing to do with he or she. It's the being mortal you don't get it. Being insufficient, or let's use another word that she doesn't use, incomplete, unfinished, kind of like the stone of Ungit. Okay? She says, and then when they took me to the bed, and then he came. He, the bridegroom, the God himself. Don't look at me like that. 
because the rule gets this look on our face like, how dare you sleep with somebody? She says, I, I'm sorry, I can't bear this any longer. If this is all true, I've been wrong all my life. Uh-huh. That's the point. In fact, that's the point of the entire novel. In fact, that's the point of, I would argue, every one of Lewis's novels. We've all been wrong all our entire lives. Everything has to be begun over again. So what does she say? Psyche, is it true? Excuse me, Psyche, it is true? You're not playing a game with me? Show me. Show me your palace. What does she mean? I got to see it with my own eyes. What do we, people always say, I have to see it, what? To believe it. What did St. Thomas say after the resurrection? When all the apostles were gathered together, he said, I'm not going to believe you. When all the other ten had seen Christ, he said, not unless I put my finger through his hand and my hand in his side while I believe. A week later, Jesus shows up, taps him on the shoulder, says, Hi, Tom. Come on. Do it. My Lord and my God. What does it take? For him it takes seeing. What does Christ say? Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Okay? Show me your... She goes, okay. Come on, let's go in. Don't be afraid, whatever you see or hear. Is it far? Far to where? To the palace. To this God's house. What do you mean? And a rule starts to tremble a little bit. I mean, where is the palace? But this is it, Psyche says. Here, you are standing on the stairs of the great gate. Now, from... A rule's perspective, where is she standing? In the little forest clearing. Yeah, in the woods. Okay. From Psyche's perspective, where is she standing? On the steps of a On the steps palace. of a massive palace. Okay. Notice from each of their perspectives, what can you say? Is either of them wrong? No. No. Not from their particular perspectives. When Arul looks around, she sees trees and leaves and a stream and grass and her sister beside her. <coughs> when Psyche looks around, she sees this massive house of the god. And now we're coming to that part of my history on which my charge against the gods chiefly rests. Okay? And she says, and my first thought was, she's mad. She's completely bonkers. We must go away at once. This is a terrible place. Why does a rule say that? Notice the question she asks. Was I believing in her invisible palace? A Greek will laugh at that. But it's different in gloom. Why would a Greek laugh? Because it's obviously not there. Because there's nothing invisible. Yeah. Okay? But in gloom? Hmm. There the gods are too close to us. In other words... You can't really say what's real and what isn't real in gloom. So you don't see it. Excuse me. So you do see it. See what? This, the gates, the shining walls. There's nothing there. Feel it. Slap it. Beat your head against it. Here, she goes to grab her hands. Stop it. Stop it. You're pretending. She wants her to be pretending. How did I know whether she really saw invisible things or spoke in madness? Okay, this gets back to my question. What is Psyche at this point? 
Is she one who, let's use language of um, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, is she one who dwells simultaneously in the realm of the blessed and here? Meaning not the realm of the blessed. So that she sees both? Seems like Psyche doesn't see here anymore. Like she, like Orwell sees Psyche, but Psyche doesn't see the trees and the, the, the little berries and the, the stream and the water. She doesn't see any of the things that Orwell sees besides yeah. herself. She's very unlikely dressed in rags in um, in her world. In her, um, yeah. Um, Either way, something hateful and strange had begun. What's the hateful and strange thing that had begun? It's either that she actually is. See, that's the thing. I okay. Think, I think what Orwell is saying here is that, like, she's saying either way. It, she's she either either what Psyche's saying is true, and that's also hateful and strange. Okay. Or what she's saying is false, and she's insane, and that that is hateful and strange on its own. Or or what else? What else might be the hateful and strange thing? They're separating. There's a huge division between them. Hmm. Huge. And they're separating again either way. It's it's a gulf <laughs> that cannot be bridged. Okay? Because it cannot be, you know, big huge house and simultaneously trees. It's got to be one or the other. So, Psyche says, but you tasted the wine. What wine? The wine I gave you. That was water from a stream. But you praised the wine, and the I praised your hands. So that was all? You didn't see a cup? You tasted no wine? This is what he meant. You can't see it. You can't feel it. For you, it is not there. Why? Why does a rule slash Maya not see it, not feel it? What position, this is a giveaway, what position does this put her in in relation to the last battle of the Chronicles of Narnia. She's the dwarf. She's the dwarves at the end of the last battle who go into the little manger and all they see is the inside of a manger or in a shed. And all they see is the inside of a shed. Everyone else, everyone else who goes in sees the real Narnia. Heaven. And what's interesting about that too is it's, it's not entirely simply because that's what they expected to see. Because, for instance, uh, what's his name? The, the collarman. Emmett. Emmett, yeah. He goes in expecting to see, you know, all kinds of horrible things. That he, that, and, and, but he also sees the real Narnia. It's but like, he willingly goes yeah. in because he what? He believes. Yeah. Okay. The problem with the dwarves is they don't believe. Their minds are shut. They live in what's called, in philosophy, a closed system. It will not admit to any other possibilities. Okay? Psyche's mind has always been open to the god. Okay? Well, rules has it. Even though she says, I know we live closer to the gods, blah, 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 because she's been so influenced by the fox. So, she says... I came almost to a full belief. She was shaking, stirring me a dozen different ways. But had I not shaken her at all? I was as weak beside her as the fox beside the priest. This valley was indeed a dreadful place. Full of the divine, sacred, no place for mortals. What did the priest say about holy places? They're dark. They're hidden. They're mysterious. Okay? Okay. And she thinks, years after I dreamed again and again that I was in some well-known place, most often the pillar room, and everything I saw was different from what I touched. Okay. Imagine for a moment, waking up one morning 
and you start to go about your daily business, you know, and you pick up your toothbrush, and it's not a toothbrush. That is, it looks like a toothbrush, but what you pick up feels like it has fur and moves. What would that do to your mind? Okay, and then you go to find your shoes, and you grab a shoe, and you're Row! and you put it back down. You look at it, you kick it with your foot. It doesn't do anything, and you touch it, and you start to hear. Well, no school today. I'm going back. To okay. <laughs> yeah, it would be. I'm climbing back into bed, and I'm going to try getting up again. Okay. I think G.K. Chesterton wrote a novel. That's like that. I can't remember what it's called. Where everything that this main character expects to touch is not what it appears to be. Like he picks up a coffee cup and it's an orange. Okay? And it doesn't have coffee in it. It doesn't have anything when he does this. What's that about? And yet it looks like a coffee. And what he's he's kind of getting there people to see the wonder of everything that they see Morifak. around them. Yeah, it's more effect, which is backwards coffee room. Okay? So, they keep talking. Um, let me skip a bit. And page 124, the rule says... When Psyche tells her, it's okay, it's all true, don't worry, he'll make you able to see, I don't want it. I don't want it. I hate it. Hate it, hate it, hate it. Why? What do you hate? Notice she can't put it into words. You know, this. This what? This thing that comes to you in the darkness and you are forbidden to see it. Holy darkness, you call it. What sort of thing? Everything's dark about the gods. What is it she hates? That the gods don't speak in clear language. That the gods don't speak in perfect images. How do they speak? with thunder and rumblings on a mountain, with a burning bush. Okay? They don't sit down and deal with individuals face to face. Which we're going to find out why if we get to the end of the novel. Okay? So the rule's like, you got to come back. You got you to come back with me. How? How can I go back? She says, this is my home. I am a wife. Of what? Oh, if only you... Come on. You like it. Of course I like it. He's a god. Okay? Um, so, a rule goes away. She goes back to Bardia. Bardia rests. They sleep back to back because it's going to be cold. This is um, chapter 12. Psyche, uh, excuse me, Arul wakes up early and she goes to the stream to get some water. Okay. She walks over to the stream. She gets her drink, we're told, ice cold, and I thought it steadied my mind, but would a river flowing in the God's secret valley really do that? This is another of the things to be guessed, for when I lifted my head and looked once more into the mist across the water, I saw that which brought my heart into my throat. There stood the palace, gray. As all things were gray in that hour. Why? Because it was early in the morning and it was misty. But solid and motionless, wall within wall, pillar and arch and architrave, acres of it, a labyrinthine beauty. Okay. 
What position is a rule in when she sees this? She's kneeling. She's kneeling. She's down on her hands and knees, scooping the water up. Okay? Her, her physical position is very important here. All right? And she goes on and describes. I mean, what is she seeing? Pinnacles and buttresses leap up. Unbelievably tall and slender, pointed and prickly as if stone were shooting out in a branch and flower. And she thinks, and Psyche is asleep in that house, in the God's arms. And I, what had I done and said? What would it do to me for my blasphemies? I must ask, skipping a little bit, I must ask forgiveness of Psyche as well as of the God. I had dared to scold her, but all the time she was far above me, herself now hardly mortal. If what I saw was real, I was in great fear. Perhaps it was not real. I looked and looked to see if it would not fade or change. Notice, as long as she stays on her knees, it doesn't change at all. Then as I rose, for all this time I was still kneeling where I drunk, almost before I stood on my feet, the whole thing was vanished. Why? Why is it important that she sees it when she's kneeling? And it vanishes when she rises to her feet. It's a humble, it's a gesture of humility. And that's the only way that she, that a person, a human being, can approach the gods. Okay. True. What else? I mean, it's definitely an aspect of humility. I think there's also a suggestion here that her reason is submerged under that humility. That the humility essentially is this belief what things may be. Okay? But once she stands up, once she, you know, let's use this language, gets on her own two feet, reason takes over again. And now you who read give judgment. That moment when I either saw or thought I saw the house, does it tell against the gods or against me? Would they make it a part of their defense? Would they say it was a sign, a hint, beckoning me to answer the riddle? She says, no, I'm not going to grant them that. Why not? What is the use of a sign which is itself only another riddle? Why give a sign of a sign of a sign of a sign of a sign? Okay, this isn't necessarily just talking about Greek gods. I mean, I think this is Lewis wrestling with pe problems that people have had from time immemorial. Um, if the gods are real, why don't they make themselves clear? One of the things that's interesting about Lewis's personal history too is that like he's he'd been working on this since he was an undergraduate, so like long before his conversion to Christianity. Oh, yeah. In fact, I think I read somewhere that the majority of, or at least a version of the first part of this book was already written before he before his conversion, um, or something like that. Like he, okay. he had he had dealt with like um, verse form, different like um, verse forms and things like that with it, and so there was there was some version of this story already written. Okay. Before he was converted to Christianity, which I think is interesting because. It so captures that kind of that, that sort of that sort of attitude. Mm -hmm. in the she has this she has the skeptic's mind that Lewis has, and it's sort of when he goes back and rewrites it, he's sort of commenting on his earlier self. Yeah, I mean, in in one sense, you could say a rule a rule is quote unquote pre Christian Lewis loves myth, loves you know quote unquote religions doesn't believe they have any truth to them, doesn't believe they have any real meaning, you know, loves literature for the same reason, okay? But what he desperately wants is for there to be some truth 
to it. All right? So, she says, what is the sign of a sign which is itself only another riddle? She says, it might, I'll, I'll give you this, it might be a true seeing. The cloud over my mortal eyes may have been lifted for a moment. In other words, it might be Tolkien's recovery. But, either way, there's divine mockery in it. Why? Because they set the riddle and then allow a seeming that can't be tested. And can only quicken and thicken the tormenting whirlpool of your guesswork. If they had an honest intention to guide us, why is their guidance not plain? St. Paul says in Corinthians, Now we see but through a glass darkly. What does he mean? We are like um, Matthew Arnold's you know, armies on a darkling plain, he says in Dover Beach. Doing what? Kind of reaching out. Okay? Not seeing what we're bumping into, etc. A rule is saying here, if the gods are real, and if they wanted us to follow them, why don't they draw an arrow in the ground that says to the gods, follow us here. Why not make it clear? Okay? She goes back to Bardia. Bardia. She explains kind of to Bardia. She doesn't tell him what exactly she saw. But she says, um, Then you think there really was a palace in the valley, though I couldn't see it? Bardia. I don't well know what's really when it comes to houses of gods. In other words, what's he saying? Our words fail us when it comes to dealing with the gods. Because we don't have language. We don't have terminology that applies. Okay? Um, she and Bardia talk, and she goes back. Okay? She talks to the fox. Chapter 13. And she asks him, bottom of 141, you don't think there might be things that are real that we can't see? And he's like, because he's Greek, he says, well, of course. Justice, equality, the soul, musical notes, truth, beauty, goodness, you know, all the virtues. She's like, no, 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 that's not what I mean. If there are souls, could there not be soul houses? Not bodies, but mansions. He says, you make me think that you don't understand anything I've taught you. I know what you mean by the soul, grandfather. But, you know, do you even, you, know all? Are there no things, I mean, things that, but what we can see? And he says, plenty. There are things behind our back, we can't see those. There are things out in the hallway, we can't see those. Just because we no longer see them doesn't mean they stop existing. She's like, no, he doesn't really understand. But at the same time, there's a certain insight in what he's saying, right? Like it's, like it's this idea that, like you know, that okay, yeah, there are things that we can't see, and you know, it is only our orientation to them that makes. Well, sense yeah, that because the things are behind our back. If we turned, we would see them. Yeah. Okay. Um. So they keep talking. What does he do? He provides a rational response to what is going on with Psyche. So who is this God that she sleeps with? Well, he's a man, obviously. A man came and rescued her. He took her to his house while she was delirious. And he doesn't allow her to see him. Why? Because he wouldn't be a God or... Because maybe there's something else about him. Okay. Um, so she decides to go back. Page 150. I'm skipping a bunch. 
Psyche, uh, a rule is kind of all alone, and she's thinking, you are alone, a rule. Whatever is to be done, you must devise and do it. No help will come. All gods and mortals have drawn away from you. You must guess the riddle. Notice what she takes upon herself. She must be Psyche's savior. Okay? She takes that upon herself. Not a word will come to you until you have guessed wrong, and they all come crowding back to accuse and mock and punish you for it. In other words, she's making herself out to be a tragic queen also. The very same kind of tragic queen that Weston the Unman wanted Tinadril to become. <clears throat> okay? Um, so she keeps thinking. She goes on to bed. She's thinking whatever she must do. She must do it tomorrow, etc., and she puts together what Bardia said, that it must be a man, and what the fox said. In page 151, in the middle paragraph, she says, I was the child of Gloam and the pupil of the fox. What does she mean? The child of Gloam. It's like she's saying she had sucked at the breasts of Gloam, which gave her what? Belief in something. Belief in what? Well, that was the whole thing, is that Gloam's religion was all very vague and shadowy. And uh, the possibilities mm -hmm. that all this could be real. But she's the pupil of the fox. What has he taught her? It can all be rationalized away. Yeah. Trust in reason. Trust in logic. I saw that for years my life had been lived in two halves never fitted together. Okay. I think that's C.S. Lewis. I think Lewis is saying that. He was a child of gloam, meaning he was a child of mythology. There wasn't a myth that Lewis read that he didn't love. And when he first read Northern Mythology, when he first read about the death of Baldur, he says, you know, it was like going into another world for him. Okay? And it's interesting how Gloom has a kind of a Germanic kind of... Yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's, north, it's, of it's north of Greece. It's, yeah. yeah, it's in okay. some, at least Central Europe. Um, but he's the child, or she's the child of the fox. Excuse me, the pupil of the fox. He is a pupil, a disciple of what? Greek learning, as Lewis himself was. You know, he took a first in grades. The Greek classics, the Greek philosophers. That was all his learning. Okay, All of his quote-unquote literature, that was largely self-taught. He did take a second degree in literature. Okay. But his, his reading of myth and fairy tale and all that kind of, that was all self-taught, self-read, etc. So he grows up, you know, wanting to be in one world. And his training and his teaching all teaches him only what is true, only what is real, only what is seen. Which is why even before he becomes a Christian, you know, he's dabbling. We didn't read Surprised by Joy, but he talks about dabbling in the occult, in German Romanticism, and how if he hadn't okay, met the friends that he met, he probably would have gone to a very dark place. And the friends that he met, they were all Christians. These friends that he surrounded himself with at Oxford, and all the literature he really, really liked was written by Christians. Milton and Bunyan and Spencer and Chaucer, Dante. Okay. So she says, I must give up then trying to judge between Bardia and my master. Bardia, a child of Gloam, her master, a pupil of Greece. And as soon as she makes that decision, she decides. Page 152. Right in the middle of the page. Part of my mind now is saying, 
do not meddle. Anything, excuse me, might be true. You are among marvels that you do not understand. Carefully, carefully, who knows what ruin you might pull down on her head and yours. But then she says, but she's just a child. And if the present case were beyond my understanding, how much more must it be beyond hers? Children must obey. She's saying, Psyche is just a child. Why? Because she's younger, chronologically, than a rule. And yet, what does Tenadrill teach Ransom? That younger yeah. Age has nothing to do with chronology. Age has to do with development. Okay? So, she goes back to bed, and she goes back to see Psyche, and she starts challenging her. Notice what she asks Psyche on page 161, when she says, how can you know if you have never seen him? What does she mean, how can you know? How do you know if he's really a god? What is she really saying? Or, what role is she playing? She's kind of Western. <laughs> you really think you're going to die if you eat that fruit? How do you know? Notice. She's wanting Psyche to fall into the trap of wanting proof. Okay? Psyche says, How can you be simple? How could I not know? But how, Psyche? What am I to answer to such a question? It's not fitting. It, 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 you're a virgin. <laughs> In other words, what's she saying? Believe me, I know. Well, if you're so sure, you won't refuse to put it to the test. If you're sure, prove it. What's this just another way of saying? Honey, sweetie, if you really love me, you'll have sex with me. If you really love me, you'll what? Prove it. Anytime love has to be proven, it's not love. What test? I don't need a test. Well, here, I brought a lamp and some oil. Wait till he sleeps, then take a look at him. I can't do that. Ah. Because you're afraid. Oh, a rule, what evil you think. The reason I cannot look at him is that he has forbidden me. Well, then why would you accept such a forbidding? A rule says, page 163, who that loved you could be angry at your breaking so unreasonable a command? And for so good a reason. I mean, it's just like Weston tempting Tenadrill. <laughs> Foolishness. He is a god. What does that mean? He has his reasons. And I'm not a god. How should I know of them? She's being put in the position of Eve in the Garden of Eden. He's a god. He told us, don't eat. I don't know what his reasons are. What are the reasons? Simple obedience. Period. Then you won't do it. You think that you can prove him a god and set me free from the fears that sicken my heart, but you won't do it. I would if I could, then do it. I command you, I, Maya says. And she says, I'm, I'm doing this because I love you. Page 165. Psyche. <laughs> you are indeed teaching me about kinds of love. I did not know. It is like looking into a deep pit. I am not sure whether I like your kind better than hatred. Oh, a rule to take my love for you because you know it goes down to my very roots and cannot be diminished. And then to do what? To turn it into a tool, a weapon. But isn't that often 
what we do to those whom we love? We turn our love into a tool, into a weapon, into a means of manipulation? Psyche, if I do this thing, notice, it will not be for any doubt of my husband or his love. It will only be because I think better of him than of you. What does she mean? Will he be angry? Yes, he'll be angry. But he is not cruel like you. I'll not believe it. He will know how I was tortured into my disobedience. He will forgive me. In other words, she does what she does, knowing it is wrong, but believing she will be forgiven. A rule, he'll never know. In other words, you don't have to tell him. And Psyche's like, are you crazy? You think I wouldn't tell him? It doesn't matter. And even now, said Psyche, I know what I do. I know that I'm betraying the best of lovers and that perhaps before sunrise, all my happiness may be destroyed forever. This is the price you've put on your love. I must pay it. Notice, what is she saying she becomes? Ransom. She's becoming the ransom for a rule's quote-unquote love. Go, you have saved your life. Go and live it as you can, Psyche says to a rule. Now, does Psyche know the full import of what she's saying? Not necessarily. But she is becoming a rule's savior. Okay? Chapter 15. A rule goes back to the valley and she's thinking, hmm, maybe I was wrong. I don't know. What if he was a god? And the next morning when she wakes up, the light is what strikes her. In page 171, the great voice which rose up from somewhere close to the light went through my whole body in such a swift wave of terror that it blotted out even the pain in my arm. It wasn't an ugly sound. It was golden. Notice, the sound was golden. My terror was the salute that mortal flesh gives to immortal things. She realized, oops. <laughs> a great flash laid the valley bare to her eyes, and then the lightnings one after another. And through the lightning, she has a glimpse of a face, as swift as a true flash of lightning. Page 172 at the bottom. Not my eyes only, but my heart and blood and very brain were too weak for that. A monster would have subdued me less than what? Than the beauty this face wore. This is the face that kind of all faces are drawn to. And what happens? He rejected, denied, answered, and worst of all, he knew all I had thought done, or been. Notice, thought, that all occurs up here. Done occurs out there. Been, past. She's saying he knew everything about me. He made it to be as if from the beginning I had known that Psyche's lover was a god. What does that mean? He made it to be as if. His gaze is using her. Uh, okay. What, what does she mean? She knew from the beginning. Psyche was telling the truth. And as if all my doubtings, fears, guessings, debatings, questionings of Bardia, questionings of the Fox, all the rummage, all the business of it had been trumped up foolery, dust blown in my own eyes by myself. 
He made it seem like that was all my own doing. So, you who read my book, you judge. Was it so? Had it been that way always? What did she experience at the brook? She looked up, and there was the house. She saw it with her own two eyes, and it disappeared in front of her eyes. Was the fact that it disappeared mean that it did not exist? And she hears, now Psyche goes out in exile. Now she must hunger and thirst and tread hard roads. Those against whom I cannot fight must do their will upon her. You, woman, shall know yourself in your work. You also shall be Psyche. What does that mean? Let me rephrase that. How does a rule take that to mean? That she also will suffer. Mm -hmm. She doesn't take it to mean she will also become the bride of the God. Okay? And she hears weeping, and as she moves away, page 175, she says, I looked on the things about me with a new eye. Now that I had proved for certain that the gods are, and that they hated me, did the gods say that? No. It seemed that I had nothing to do but to wait for my punishment. But she thinks about those words. You also shall be Psyche. And she thought that it meant that if she went in exile wandering, I must do the same. But what happens to her? She goes back and becomes queen of Gloam. She has all the power in the world, as it were. But she thinks, if I could have borne hers as well as my own, that is punishment, but next best was to share. And with this I felt a sort of hard and cheerless strength arising in me. I would make a good beggar woman. I was ugly, and Bardia had taught me to fight. She goes back to the palace. She tells the fox what she did. And, line, pardon? I love that line. I would make a good beggar woman. I'm ugly, and I know how to fight. Right. <laughs> it's just like... I would do well at this. And she tells us on page 180, um, she says that the, the fox told her that you have a secret for me. No, don't, don't turn away. Did you think I would try to press or conjure it out of you? In other words, you're keeping something from me. Friends must be free. My tormenting you to find it would build a worse barrier between us than you're hiding it. You must obey the God within you, not the God within me. And yet, what did she just make her sister do? Obey the God within her, not her own God. So this is, you know, she hears these words of the fox, and they're like damning her. She goes on, she says, I never told Barty of the story of the night. And then she starts to talk about herself. Hitherto, like all my countrywomen, I had gone bareface. The original title of the novel was Bareface. On those two journeys up the mountain, I had worn a veil because I wished to be in secret. Now, I determined I would go always veiled. Why? Why does she want to veil her face? The obvious answer is that she's ashamed of what she Okay. Did. And so the, the, that's sort of a universal um, sign of shame is hiding your face. Um, is it because she's ugly? No. She, Look what happens when she goes to her father. She goes to her father. He's ve uh, She's veiled. And we're told... She says at the bottom of 181, to see his face while he could not see mine seemed to give me a kind of power. And he says, do you begin to set your wits against mine? And she says, yes. 
He stares and he says, oh, you're like all women. And what happens? He never strikes her again and she never fears him again. So the veil gives her power. He dies. She becomes king. Excuse me, queen. Okay. I'm going to skip a bunch. Um, go on to... Yeah, I'm skipping a whole bunch. Go on to chapter 20. This is after she becomes queen. She bur burned the old king. And we're told on page 227, my real strength lay in two things. The first was that I had, especially for the first years, two very good counselors, the fox and Bardia. Okay, what's her second strength? Her veil. She says, I could never have believed what it would do for me. The best story, years pass, okay, various reasons are told about why she wears a veil, and she says, the best story was that I had no face at all. If you were stripped off my veil, you'd find emptiness. Notice. Sound like anybody else in the novel? Ungit? The stone with no face? She says, but another sort said that I wore a veil because I was of a beauty so dazzling that if I let it be seen, all men in the world would run mad. Or else that Ungit was jealous of my beauty and had promised to blast me if I went bareface. I became something very mysterious and awful. Like the gods. In that sense, like, um, like Psyche, at least in the original myth. Yeah. She's originally, yeah. Um, you know, she makes... <coughs> But she's like the god. She she's like the gods in that you know what is her harangue against the gods? They're mysterious, and awful, meaning full of awe, and that's what she becomes. Okay. Um, we hear a lot of talk about what a good queen she is. Uh, she's resourceful. Gloom prospers. Um, and she meets some travelers. Page 241. And the travelers say, does the stranger want to make an offering to the goddess? And she says, uh, who is it? Istra. She says, I never heard of such a goddess. Well, it's because she's new. She's a young goddess. She's only just begun to be a goddess. For she began by being immortal. And how was she godded? She says, you know that? They say, that's really strange. And they tell her the story of Cupid and Psyche. Okay. Page 243. And so he said, when her two sisters had seen the beautiful palace and been feasted and given gifts, they, she, whoa, whoa, stop. They saw the palace? Well, you're, you're interrupting the story. Yes, they saw the palace. They weren't blind, and they weren't stupid. And she's like, that's not right. How could any mortal have known of that palace at all? That much of the truth they had dropped into someone's mind, in a dream or an oracle, or however. That much, and what? Wiped clean out the very meaning, the pith, the central knot of the whole tale. Which is what? I didn't see the palace! I didn't eat in the palace. I didn't sleep in the palace. Do I not do well to write a book against them? For if the true story had been like their story, what? No riddle would have been set, right? I mean, if you take the Cupid and Psyche myth, as it has been passed down, why do the two sisters convince Psyche to do what they want her to do? Because they're jealous. And they want her to lose everything she has. They see it. They know it. In terms of the beauty of the palace. And that she is actually wedded to a god. Moreover, she says. There would have been no guessing and no guessing wrong. It's a story belonging to a different world. A world in which the gods 
show themselves clearly and don't torment men with glimpses, nor unveil to one what they hide from another, nor ask you to believe what contradicts your eyes and ears and nose and tongue and fingers. And I think what Lewis is saying there is, and that is what is different between the world of the gods in Greek and Roman mythology and Christian mythology. Okay? The gods are pretty clear in Greek and Roman mythology. In, uh, in the Iliad, um, I, even though I knew the basic plot of the Iliad, I was always surprised when the gods just sort of showed up. They were just sort of there on the battlefield, and they're like, oh, that guy just shot Mars. Okay. You know, yeah, just... not going to hurt him, but mm, the guy who shot him, he's going to pay for it. Or, oh, look, Athena. She of the gray eyes of the wine dark sea, you know, okay? When the gods appear, it's clear who they are, okay? Most of the time. Yeah, there are times when it's not clear. But usually the repercussions are always very clear, right? So she says, and now to tell my story as if I had had the very sight they had denied me. It's not as if you told a cripple story and never said he was lame. Or told how a man betrayed a secret but never said it was after 20 hours of torture. So he goes on and he's talking about the two sisters, etc. She's like, um, but why did they want to separate her from the God in the first place? They wanted to destroy her because they had seen her power. But why? Well, because they were jealous. She's like, I wasn't jealous. I was near to believing that there are no such things. Okay? Top of 245. The memory of his voice and face was kept in one of those rooms of my soul that I didn't lightly unlock. Now instantly I knew. And notice how he started using this word face a lot. I knew I was facing them. I with no strength and they with all. I visible to them, they invisible to me. In other words, it's like the gods are wearing veils and they can see everything and we can see nothing. This is the point where I just started underlining every time I saw the word face. <laughs> just <Okay. laughs> because it, was, it just kept showing up. And she thinks, me, jealous of Psyche? And, he hear, and she hears about wanders, weeping, weeping, always weeping, and falls under the power of Talapal, who hates her, okay, Cupid's mother. Page 249. She reaches home. She writes her book, and she says, and now here it stands, and now you who read, judge between me and the God. They gave me nothing in the world to love but Psyche and then took her from me. See, now this is what I find so ironic. Lewis was a happy old bachelor. And then he meets Joy David Mingresham and falls head over heels in love with her. In a grief observed, he talks about his body missing her body. Her form next to his. Okay. Lewis's um, secretary, Walter Hooper, who was only a secretary very briefly before Lewis died. But Walter Hooper holds to this fiction, and he spreads this fiction that Lewis and Joy never consummated their marriage, that they never had sex. It's pretty clear when you read A Grief Observed. Oh, no. They had sex. They knew each other's bodies very well. He goes on, excuse me, she goes on. Then they brought me to her at such a place in time that it hung on my word whether she should continue in bliss or be cast out into misery. Did it? Did it hold on her word? No. They would not tell me whether she was the bride of a god or mad or a brute or villain spoil. They would give no clear sign, though I begged for it. No clear sign? 
Was Psyche mad? Was she drooling? Were her eyes rolling in her head? No. Did she speak lucidly and clearly? Yes. Did she talk about things that a rural couldn't see? Yes. Does that mean she's mad? No. And now, and now, they have set out a lying story, she says, in which I was given no riddle to guess, but knew and saw that she was the God's bride, and that I acted of my own will, and that for jealousy. What's ironic about this, too, is that even though the story um, has her jealous of, of Psyche in, in this story, you could more easily argue that she was jealous of Cupid. Sure. <laughs> having, having taken yeah, Psyche. Cupid has Psyche, her. yeah. Um, so she goes on. But it, ultimately it's still jealousy. Oh, sure. I say the gods deal very unrightly with us, for they will neither go away and leave us to live our own short days to ourselves, nor will they show themselves openly and tell us what they would have us do. Think for a moment of the Chronicles of Narnia. Who in the Chronicles of Narnia regularly is the first one to see Aslan? It's Lucy. It's Lucy. Why not Peter? Why does Peter always have to be led? Or, or even the others. You know, even in the last battle. Peter's not clear. At the beginning, it's Lucy. Why? Because he's the older, wiser one. The one who knows it all. Lucy is the one with childlike innocence and wonder. Even when she's older. Okay? She's, um, let's use a modern example. It's non-Lewisian and non-specifically Christian. It's like the Polar Express. And the little kid who hears the bell, even though it's, oh, honey, it's broken. And he grows old, and he can shake the bell, and he can still hear it ring, even though his sister cannot. Okay? But to hint and hover, to draw near us in dreams and oracles, or an awaking vision that vanishes as soon as seen, to be dead silent when we question them, and then glide back and whisper words we cannot understand, in our ears when we most wish to be free of them, and to show to one what they hide from another. In, in the last 2,000 years, in the history of the Christian church, there are countless stories of men and women receiving visions, receiving experiences that other people do not receive. Other people who want and pray and ask for proof, and they don't get it. And the people who don't want and pray and ask for these experiences, receive them. Some of them, they receive them repeatedly throughout their lives. Some of them have received them so often, if you accept, you know, the stories, their lives are transformed. Okay? Why must holy places be dark places? Why can't God just turn on the light when he comes into the room and make it all clear? Okay? She says, But I will, will not all the world then know, and the gods will know it knows, that this is because they have no answer. The gods won't answer. Next section. Not many days have passed since I wrote those words, and now I must enroll it again. Why? <laughs> because I have to add to it. Notice, she can't go back. She says, I can't amend it. Okay? So now I'm going to add to it. To leave it as it was would be to die perjured. 
In other words, everything she's going to talk to write about in this little section at the end, this has already essentially happened. I know so much more than I did about the woman who wrote it. What began the change was the very writing itself. The past which I wrote down was not the past that I thought I had been remembering. I did not see clearly many things that I see now. The change which the writing wrought in me was only a beginning, only to prepare me for the God's surgery. They used my own pen to probe my wound. And again, I can't help but think, man, this is like almost like prophecy. Because Lewis does the same thing then in A Grief Observed. Okay, so, um, was, I've always wondered this, like, the, the, the typical story of A Grief Observed has Lewis sort of writing it for himself in a sort of therapeutic way, you mm -hmm. know, and then eventually somebody reads it and, you know, um, tries to get him to publish it. Um, and this is all happening, I guess, after he writes this. Oh, yeah. Grief Observer is written in 1960 after Joy yeah. dies. This is published right. in 1956. 1956, right, okay. Um, was the last battle published in 57? Uh, anyway. Um, I don't think so. Because I could have sworn that, like, the... Language Wardrobe was in 1950, and then they reach. They weren't one year no, apart. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Um, they weren't one year apart? Okay. Um, well, anyway. Uh, my question is, is, like, is there any sense that the group, that a group observed went through amendations before it was published? Like, is it... There's no way to know. No manuscripts survive... Um, when Lewis died in 63, Paxford, his gardener, um, was caught burning piles of papers that he took out that apparently Lewis did not want kept. Um, you know, and, and things that survived, um, I think it's um, Walter Hooper that mentions, you know, he stopped him. Uh, some of the things that survived were, you know, copies of letters and Stuff like that. Um, anyways. Um, page 256. She, um, she's, she goes back to her writing. It says, so back to my writing. The continual labor of mine to which it put me began to overflow into my sleep. It was a labor of sifting and sorting, separating motive from motive and both from pretext. This same sorting went on every night in my dreams, but in a changed fashion. I thought I had before me a huge, hopeless pile of seeds. So, in her dreams, she's doing what? Sifting, trying to sort through seeds. Trying to sort, as she says, through motive. Okay. But she says it changes to sorting through seeds, and what do we find out later? That that's exactly what Psyche's been doing. Okay. Um... Let's see here, go on, because she's going to use several images like this. Um, she goes and she talks with Ansett, Bardia's wife. And Ansett just kind of lays into her. Read her the riot act, page 260. And we're going to take a break in a moment. She says, perhaps you never saw him, queen, at the times when a man shows his weariness. You never saw his haggard face in early morning, nor heard his groan when you must shake him and force him to rise. You never saw him come home late from the palace, hungry, yet too tired to eat. Well, you mean that is work? Five wars, 31 battles, taking thought for this and that, etc. The mines are not the only place where a man can be worked to death. This is after Barty's death. And she's like, it's not my fault. Okay. They keep talking, page 262. The queen says, but you, you, you've had all, all that you left me, queen. Left you, fool? 
Oh, I know you weren't lovers. You left me that. The divine blood will not mix with subjects, they say. You left me my share. When you had used him, you would let him steal home to me until you needed him again. What is Ansett saying? That for all intents and purposes, she was his mistress, essentially. Well, no, she says, I know you, I know he... Right, no, no, yeah, I, I know what, literally. Yeah, I know what you mean by essentially. No, she means you had all the best of Bardia. I got the husk that was left over. I was the one, she seems to be saying, you know, who rubbed his shoulders and back and feet when they were sore, etc. Notice, Arul sees right through what she's getting at. Are you jealous? And she pulls aside her veil and says, look, look, you fool. Are you jealous of this? And she started back from me gazing so that for a moment I wondered if my face were a terror to her. But it was not fear. And what does Ansett say? Oh, I never knew. You also. What? You loved him. You've suffered too. We both. And they're in each other's arms weeping. Okay? Arua loved Bardia in her own way. Um... And so she says, why, you know, do you want me to send Bardia back, etc.? Why didn't you tell me, blah, blah, blah? I'm going to skip a bunch because we need to have time to finish. Um, okay, let's take a break.